Welcome to episode 664 of the Aussie Tech Heads, recorded on the 30th of January 2020. Aussie Tech Heads is brought to you by startnewcompany.com.au. Register your company fast, easy and direct with ASIC, all documentation is provided and held in your account for downloading at any time. If you're an accountant or other professional, you're also able to brand all your documents with the company name. Coming soon, ABN, TFN and Trusts. Special discount for codes for ATH listeners at the cart, use ATH20 for a $20 discount. And ATHwebhosting.com.au. Servers operate on SSD drives, immediate activation, SSL certificates, Aussie support, domain registration, easy install of WordPress, Joomla, and Drew Powell. And I'm your host, Jason Oakley, and I'm joined this week again by Will Tompkinson. Hey, Will. Hey, mate. How's things going up there in God's Zone? Uh, still bloody hot, I tell you. <laughs> Absolutely stupid. What? Well, and they've got even further up, they got flooding. Oh, uh, the state's gone mad. There's still places on fire. There's flooding in some places. There's drought in others. There's, it's all over the show. Just and one of our little friends knows all about the flooding. Yeah, that's why um, Glenn's still out of order at the moment. He's like his entire office and studio and laundry and basement and all sorts of stuff all got flooded. So might be a few weeks before we see his lovely face again. Yeah, he's. Um, I think you're saying he's going to try and put a video up on the Facebook page in the next few days, so keep an eye out for that and have a bit of a look. He's going to have one for us tonight, but I've actually got it from him. Hang on. <laughs> Hello, my name is Glenn Goodman, and I highly recommend this show and or product. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. That was great. <laughs> that wasn't prepared at all. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> there goes this show forever. <laughs> right. Now who will listen to it? Speaking of, nice segue. This is one you'll have to watch, I'm afraid. No, no, no amount of audio is going to do that any justice. Visual gag. <laughs> uh, we're just trying to get YouTube numbers up, that's all. Yeah. But yeah, no, Smash we, um... that button. Hit that <laughs> bell. You know how to do it. Woo! We uh, we asked last week for people for feedback, um, you know, to let us know what you thought of the show and you know what we should what we should change, what we should keep doing the same, you know, if there's any negative stuff, whatever. And um, unfortunately, everybody was really nice, 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 nice. Stop with that, nice, nice. It's unusual. Everybody was very nice, which um, you know, that's it, good and all. But I was I was, ho- I was hope hoping to get some constructive criticism but anyway we uh <laughs> we didn't so either we're doing everything right or people are just too damn friendly good news uh, is good news <laughs> so but we've got a few um we'll go through and read a handful out there's 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 too many to you know we don't want to waste the whole show reading out a couple of quick ones we've got a couple from a couple of quick ones on uh email um one's from mick uh he's <laughs> He sounds like me. Thought I'd better send this message before my short-term memory issues kick in. <laughs> um, I've been listening to your podcast for around a year and a half, and I thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, so I've at least got confirmation that one podcaster downloader who listens. Uh, as you said, it's a labor of love. And uh, yes, thanks, Mick. It is a labor thanks. of love. We, um, we, do, we don't make anything from it. We don't have enough YouTube. We're not even monetized on YouTube. Um, it, it's all funded, you know. Yeah, the that was before our, YouTube our started stuff. demonetizing everyone. <laughs> yeah, we, that's right. We never were monetized, so we didn't get demonetized. <laughs> we just weren't monetized right from the get start. So, uh, another one from um, from Nigel. Um, this one was actually it. It was too glen, but it, I'll, I'll read it out so you guys sort of understand what, what we're going through. Um, Hi, Glenn. Sorry to hear you've been affected by the recent floods in Queensland. Just wanted to add my support to your podcast. Been a weekly listener for the last ten years. So. Not far off how long the show's been going for. Uh, as I commute in and out of Perth, uh, I really enjoy the humour you put into the tech stories while said you're heading at the same time. I understand it must take a lot of your time, but I'm sure I am one of many who really appreciate it. Um, so that was from Nigel. And he says, happy Australia Day to everyone. So that was the other day. Um, and yeah, that, that's right. It's, um, yeah, 10 years. I've been on it for... Well, I've been, I've been on since episode 200, and so there's 200 episodes, <laughs> so what's that, four or five years before me, so you do the math on that one. <laughs> and I've been on a bit less than you. A little bit less, but 
Well, you probably it was your fault that I'm here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, he I'm, poached I'm, me I'm, from <laughs> Tech Talk Radio. Oh yeah, it was such a hard thing to do. Too. <laughs> I'm doing a shoot. Okay. I offered you no incentive, no salary, no nothing. You went, yep, no worries. <laughs> uh, I did get a minty. <laughs> yeah, but it was one we picked up off the floor. Yeah. <laughs> um, a couple of YouTube ones quickly. One from somebody, the name, his YouTube name is Raiders. Uh, he may be a lonely voice, but I'm a loyal listener, watcher. Thanks and appreciate the effort. And from Daniel 308D. Keep the show rolling, guys. You're doing an awesome job being a listener from way back. You've got a great format going, a bit of news, a bit of banter. It's almost like we know you personally, uh, which is what we kind of go for. We, you know, we're just people. We like to make people aware of that, that we're not, you know, nothing special. And we Speak go through. Speak for yourself. You're people. I didn't say human. I said people. I'm soil and cream. <laughs> I'm made of people. <laughs> so, yeah. And, um,. There's another one that I, I actually meant to copy, but I forgot saying that uh, it starts off saying, you know, it's a great show. There's occasional audio issues, but other than that, it's fine. I'm like, yeah, well, <laughs> welcome to uh, to a tech show. The only tech <laughs> show in the world to ever have a million problems. <laughs> we, 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 I think we struggle more with technology than most people who don't know how to use technology sometimes. Right. It's all tech support. We're professionals, damn it. And i uh, got... Um, one here from, um, so let's make sure I got the right one lined up. Got one here from what was his name, Brian. Um, for, he's actually listening to us from Chile at the moment. He's doing. He'll explain in the in the message, doing a bit of a around around the area tour. So Hi guys. Uh oh. So he's speaking of technical difficulties. It's an audio volume. Let's podcast. try this again. Hi guys. Hi Glenn and all you great Aussie tech headers. Just listening to your latest latest broadcast and a uh, plea for our listeners to check in. Well, I'm checking in. Just to let you know that I really appreciate. Uh, your weekly broadcasts. I listen, download, and listen to uh, almost everything. And I'm such a uh, devotee that uh, today um, I'm listening to you from southern Chile. We are about um, 500 kilometres north of uh, Santiago, and we are on a uh, eight to ten weeks um, road trip. Eight to ten thousand kilometers through the two Patagonias, that is Chilean Patagonia, and returning to our hometown up in central Chile called La Serena, returning via the Argentine uh, Patagonia. So we got a uh, a Hilux here. We rigged out for glamping, and we're staying in uh, either campgrounds, Airbnbs, pensiones hotels, whatever's uh, convenient, depending on uh, where we are, what, what the weather's like. And uh, yeah, and I take out time every week to uh, down... Uh-oh. Whoops, got chopped off there. <laughs> I did, forgot that was a 90 second uh, limit there. So I was just saying, every week while I'm on the road here down in South America, we download your show and uh, listen to it. It's a nice reminder of... Uh, Life back home. In fact, tomorrow is Australia Day, so we'll be flying our little flags as we're uh, driving down the uh, coast road here. So that's probably about it for the time being. So thanks again for your efforts that you put into uh, Aussie Tech Heads. I'm certainly one uh, listener that appreciates uh, all you do, and I hope you continue on into the infinite uh, future. So thanks, guys. All the best. E hasta la vista, hasta la próxima vez. I think you swore at the end there, but you know. <laughs> I thought that was Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> hasta la vista, baby. But uh, yeah, so that uh, if you're interested, that's through. Um, uh, what was that through? Through an app that I was going to put in, and then completely forgot to do that, <laughs> and I can't remember what it was called. <laughs> um. 
it. Well prepared. I know, yeah, as usual. Yeah, nothing, nothing <laughs> usual. I know that there were used speak to... Speakpipe. Speakpipe, yeah. I was going to say, there used to be an app, app called TalkShow, and I think this is kind of a replacement for that. Oh, okay. So, I don't know much about it. I've only... Today's literally the first time I heard about it when I heard about these messages, so I'm going to check yeah. it out, but... That was really yeah. cool. Thanks for that. We really appreciate hearing from you. It was, you know, all across, basically, as bad as far... Almost as opposite the end of the world as you can get to before yep. you can start coming back the other way again. Although, you know, if once if given that the world's flat, though, you could almost see it. It's just it's just off the east coast. Just over there. Yeah. yeah. Just look past New Zealand. It's another you need your binoculars. <laughs> so. But, uh, yeah. Alrighty. Well, I suppose we probably should pretend to do a show tonight. I guess so, since we've gotten this far. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> How about Google is working on an initiative to streamline its suite of mobile and browser-based apps for businesses into a singular experience. The app would combine Gmail, Drive, Hangouts Meet, and Hangouts Chat all in one interface and would provide easy hooks into products like Google Calendar. Google is notorious for its confusing collection of communication apps from Hangouts Classic to Hangouts Meet and Duo, as well as others that have been killed off. <laughs> Wave, never forget. <laughs> Why is everyone... <laughs> okay, nobody in the world used Wave, but everybody's disappointed that it went away. <laughs> it didn't actually go away because it's in Google no Google Docs. Google Docs work, is though. Wave. It's collaborative yeah. uh, typing up documents. They Pre just moved it into there. and Pretty much. And people are like, it's gone. <laughs> uh, and has stumbled with uh, integration before. The company's unification is clearly designed to push back against Microsoft's growth of its Teams product bleh, yeah. with larger, more established companies. Additionally, Slack has become the de facto method of real-time collaboration and communication among startups. Slack has made integrations with Google products simple while pushing users away from traditional chat-like Hangouts, while Microsoft has gone through a renaissance of, source, of sorts, releasing a bevy mm, of redesigned of communication apps like Outlook to positive reviews. I don't mind that. I mean, it's not. Uh, I mean, it's not terribly critical, I guess, if it's one app or three apps. But it does. I guess it makes into app navigation, if that's a thing, makes it easier yep. to manage. You know, at the end of the day, it's not. Log into this website. Log into that one. Log into this. Click on yeah. that. Watch is another thing over mm, here. I mean, not really. I mean, everything's up. In terms of the Google stuff, it's all one click away anyway. It's if you're on your browser, it's in the little. You know, if you're using Chrome, it's all up in the top right. And if you're using yep. your phone, it's all within, you know, two or three apps anyway. But I, I can't, in some respects, it's not a bad thing. It'll certainly, um, it'll streamline it, but it'll make development of apps easier and stuff too because they've only got to worry about developing one app instead of eight different apps. So, yep. you know, it's definitely not a bad thing. And it's good because you don't need eight different privacy policies, right? Yeah, well, that's, well, they don't use the one they've got, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> You went there. <laughs> that was, I didn't really, didn't really go there. It was lead, handed to me that one. <laughs> uh, actually, have you noticed? Um, even everything now is asking so, the the cookies thing. But I don't know if you've noticed on the latest Minecraft update, when you click on multiplayer, it pops up a big thing saying you are now going on to the internet, and we're not responsible for what you'll see on servers, and you must agree to this before you go any further. Somebody's going to make <laughs> rude things out of blocks, and your kids might see them. It's not, not Roblox; it's Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just—I've so, seen some shapes people yeah, use with pink blocks. It's just so strange that it's a thing now. Like uh, I always figured that was in the EULA or in the user agreement or somewhere in there. Anyway, I never looked for it. I just figured it was in. Maybe there that's anyway. like the YouTube copper thing has got to them now. They have to warn kids. Well, it's Microsoft, so I guess not entirely. You know. Um, uh, Microsoft, I guess they're probably, but they don't have it if you go to their their own servers, their own. Uh, oh, right. I can't think what it's called. I've got a block, mental block, but yeah, their own servers. Realms. Realms. That's it. It doesn't come up on there. It only comes up if you go to public servers. Oh. Okay. So I think they're trying to say, hey, don't use the public server. Go and use our. Go and pay to use our realm server. Ka ching <laughs> So as soon as you can't charge the public servers these days, anyway. Everybody's already got like five Minecraft accounts. So but you it's know not how like they're going to get any more income. Remember the whole thing where you couldn't charge um, for access Stuff to in a Minecraft. Public server? 
So what you yeah. do is you start a YouTube channel and you start a Discord channel and you charge people to be Patreons and then the Patreons get access to the Discord and they get access to the server. So Problem solved. <laughs> you're not charging him for access to the server, you're charging him for access to Discord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. That reminds me, I'm going to start up an Aussie Tech Head Discord too. Um, so and can... Patreon. Yeah, well, I don't think any of our viewers are... are uh, I was going to say smart enough. Are you saying they haven't enough. got money? <laughs> Yeah. I was say, none of our viewers are rich enough to forgive us any money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm not. Not now. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know how Windows is carrying on about Support. how um, there's no more uh, updates and that's it, we're, we're done with Windows 7 and you've got to... Except for that one week ago. <laughs> well, except for that one week ago. And the one that they've just, just released now as well. Um, what? But, it's Yeah, they're, they're releasing what? another bug fix. Um, apparently, there's a black wallpaper bug. That's very important to <laughs> Which fix. Which was introduced when they released the last patch. <laughs> Which fixed a massive <laughs> hole that anyone could hack any computer that's ever been made by Microsoft. <laughs> No, they uh, basically they fixed a bug that they introduced. So when they, yeah, when they uh, released the last patch ever, we're not releasing anymore. They introduced a bug that basically um, broke desktop displays. Um, so there was a couple of things that predominantly broke the wallpapers and just showed black desktops. Uh, it also managed to kill some screensavers as well and, and break those. Nothing major, but. No. Um, they window. Um, so, Mr. Microsoft, T will be rushing out to do an update, won't you, Mr. T? Yeah, because I did the last one so quickly. <laughs> um, some users figured out that the stretch configuration of settings is likely to source the problem. Microsoft finally acknowledged a glitch in Windows 7 update by adding a known issue to the original support page for the monthly rollup. Um, so, after installing KB4534310, KB because their patches just roll off the tongue, don't they? Your desktop wallpaper might display as black when set to stretch, said Microsoft. We also promised to provide a fix and updates will be made available to everybody running Windows 7 and Windows Server 2008 RS SP1. Uh, Microsoft says this issue can be resolved by setting custom image to in any option other than stretch, such as fill, fit, tile, or center. While it's relatively a minor issue compared with some of the Windows ta- top 10 bugs shipped with updates over the last past year. Well, that's an interesting read too. If you haven't had a chance to do that, there's a whole list of um. Are you gonna autoplay, aren't you? Yes. Yep. Stop. Um, <laughs> there's a list of top ten bugs that uh, they created when they made the last lot of last couple of or was it the last major patch. I think it was middle of last year before they stopped doing. Uh. It. So yeah. So basically, <coughs> lucky they've um. Uh, Microsoft still providing security updates for business customers that pay Windows 7 extended security updates while compete, completing a Windows 10 migration. One such customer is the German federal government who pays Microsoft <laughs> around 800,000 euro per year for updates. Wow. And they're offering it till January 2022. And that's why. cheaper than buying Windows 10 for all their computers and installing them. Well, yeah, I mean... Wasn't it a free upgrade? Um, it was, but now that they've stopped doing the uh, now that they've stopped doing the Windows Seven, no, uh, Windows yes, yeah, stop doing the Windows Seven updates. The Windows Ten upgrade isn't free anymore. You've now got to pay for it. Because I know when I got my mm. computer, I had to get Windows was hundred and hundred and sixty nine dollars or something. I think it was for the yep the home. Uh, so yeah, I'm like, but I just I, I got it free. They're like, yeah, but that won't work on this one because you had it on that computer and you've used your <laughs> license and it won't upgrade onto the new. Oh, crying out loud! Gone now. That's Can I just chance. put Linux on it? <laughs> you didn't want Windows 10 anyway. No, I didn't. No, I still don't. Um, still but now that my mixer's the only reason I wasn't upgrading is because the software wouldn't support my mixer. But now that that mixer's died, it doesn't matter anyway. I'll just. Oh, I thought you didn't like it either. I don't, but. That doesn't. I mean, I haven't liked any Windows since Windows ninety five. So, <laughs> three point one one was the way. It was funny when three one one came out. Work groups. The um, well, yeah, you had to get work groups, otherwise you had no networking. Yep. But it was funny when that came out. You know, everyone switched over to that, 
And then when 95 came in, it was like, oh, that's so ugly. I can't, no, you make it go away. I've never used it. And then all these add-ons come out for Windows 3.1 that had the dock start bar and had all this stuff to make it look like Windows 95 anyway. And I think over time, everyone got so used to it that they just went to Windows 95. Yeah, I, I remember, remember feeding my back in the DOS... So back in the DOS days, <laughs> I was playing this game called Pirates. Was that the Sid Meier game? Yeah. It did civilization yep. and it would pop up a window with information and then pop up another one and pop up another one, pop up another one on top of each other everywhere. Yep. I was like, I don't like this thing. I, I hate all these windows popping up. And my friend was like, you know, your windows, <laughs> when you switch to windows very soon, you're going to have those popping up all over the place and it's all going to be pop up windows everywhere. And now I live with it daily. So it's like, yes, you are right. I just didn't like it in that game. It just took me out. You're sailing on a ship and suddenly these win little window pop-ups come up on the screen all over the place with intro and it's like, it takes you out of the game. Well, that's why I like the... Um, I like the old... Um, uh, was it Windows 2? Mm. I think it was. Where it wasn't actually... Um, it was just programming. It was oh! Ah. Sorry. Wow. Sorry, I, I may I may have accidentally. Have you been eating beans again? <laughs> I may have accidentally um, loaded um, basic. You can't quite see. <laughs> that, maybe, but... 1980. That was a good year. No, it's not going to scale correctly. You wouldn't remember back that far, you young fella. <laughs> I used to use basic. In 1980. Not 1980, but. No, that's what I mean. You wouldn't remember back to 1980. I didn't use it in 1980, but I remember it in 1980. <laughs> I'll see if I can make this so you can actually see it. Oops. There's actually, if you go to um, uh, PCJS.org, there's a whole, they have a whole heap of uh, on demos built into the browser. Everything from the original IBM DOS to Microsoft to 95, 3.1, X3 Gold. It's does it have OS Warp? Uh, it probably does. Let me have a look here. IBM. It's got IBM. Oh, yeah. It says OS 2 on there. IBM OS 2. OS 2. IBM Pascal. Oh, it doesn't have Warp, though. It's got OS 2 version 1.3. but that is Warp was as far as IBM got before Microsoft took over everything by taking ideas from Warp. Yeah, so they're already much. programming applications for OS2 and they're like, hey, why don't we do our own operating system? Great idea. IBM's like, what the hell? They're like, hi, suckers. We own the world now. Yeah, no, that's that's pretty much about it. This is the OSI. Uh, simulates 6502-based microprocessors. And yeah, there's a whole heap of stuff in here. It's, it's really... It's a really neat uh, website to go to. If it's got Commodore 64, that's all that matters. <laughs> it's got the X86 8080 chip, the 6502, the 6502 yeah, chip, which is the scientific calculator chip. Now, isn't it funny that 8088 came out before the 8086? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Because right? the 6 was the, the 16-bit well, the extension. Yeah, because it was 8-bit, wasn't it? Yeah, so yeah. 8088 was 8-bit, and then they brought out 16-bit, and they're like, what do we call it? Oh, 8086. <laughs> so, yeah, but. thanks. That, that's yeah, it's Windows Windows 3. It'll probably beep again. Oh, yep, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yes. I, uh... My cousin bought an m -Strad years ago that IBM compatible that had Windows 2 on it. There you go. Yeah, Windows, this is your Windows 3 for those who have never seen it before. And those who are <laughs> listening on audio, please yeah, bear no. with us. <laughs> hey, does it actually work? Oh, it does. Sweet. <laughs> you can play the original Solitaire that they only put in there to teach people how to use a mouse. I was going to say, it's the original, um... oh great, it's captured by mouse and I can't release it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tap it, son. <laughs> yeah, it's that too. It's, uh, it was the original um, Microsoft mouse test program. The official, yeah. Uh, it was, yeah. Uh, those are the good old days. And teach people how to point and click and move a mouse around. Back when uh, operating systems only needed three discs to install and not twelve. Like when I was doing tech support and had this old lady ring up who 
couldn't use her mouse because it reached the edge of the pad and she couldn't go any further across the screen because there was no more Blockchain, mouse pad or table. Encryption and decentralized stupid servers. Stupid, and power- place, stupid website. <laughs> this one's going to do it now. Why? Why do people... We're, two, we're 2020 people. This was a thing dead in 96. Stop it. No more autoplay, please. Ah. I the worst part is that. you pause it. Well, no, Chrome doesn't stop it anymore. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to slowly switch over to uh, to Oprah because Oprah does all that stuff now. But yeah, and the worst and part is you pause it and it stays paused and then it must refresh in like five minutes time and it starts playing again. Auto refresh on news sites is also old technology that should never have existed. Stop it. And you can mm. use Ajax to update the latest headlines in the right-hand column. You don't need to reload the whole the page. Whole page yeah. Plus all the ads and go, oh, ad person, we showed your ad 50 million times this month and not 1 million <laughs> that you think it was because we keep refreshing it 50 times when people visit. That's mm-hmm. what it's about. Exactly. It's all about the money. Damn. So anyway. Whose turn is you, it? Was that your story? <laughs> I'm not sure. I <laughs> will go on with the Googles. At a press event in San Francisco, Google announced a feature that will let people use their phones to both transcribe and translate a conversation in real time into a language that isn't being spoken. The tool will be available for Google Translate app in the coming months, said Brian Lynn, an engineer on the Translate team. Right now, the feature is being tested in several languages, including Spanish, German, and French. Lynn said the computing will take place on Google servers and not on people's devices. The search giant announced the tool at a press event in San Francisco where the company showed off other artificial intelligence projects, including initiatives in health tech and touch controls for fabrics. Search giant has also talked a lot about how AI should be developed in the future. Google and Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai said last week he thinks AI should be regulated to prevent the potential negative consequences of things like deep face and face recognition. There's no question in my mind that artificial intelligence needs to be regulated, he wrote in an op-ed. It's too important not to. The only question is how to approach it. At the event, Google also previewed a hand of other AI initiatives. One project is called IO Braid, which lets people control a device by interacting with a wire. For example, you could start, stop, and control the volume of music on your phone by twisting or pinching the fabric wire of the earbuds. Another project, part of Google Health, was aimed at trying to detect anemia in patients. <clears throat> I mean, it's a good idea. Like for here, you can see they're using it on a you know reception desk for an international hotel. Oh, that'd be brilliant! Yeah, because you get people not speaking your language, and they come into your town. Mm. And it's, yeah, it's, it makes life a lot Just easier. Just hope the internet doesn't go down, or you're a bit stuffed. Yeah, I mean, but that's. Well, that's no different than anything these days. Pretty much all the software right. you're using is all online anyway, so yep. it doesn't really matter too much. But uh, fantastic. Yeah, no, I think it certainly has its places because I mean the traditional translate stuff's either flaky and yep. sort of mm, you can't sometimes actually get what you ask for. Or do you want to just sit there <laughs> typing everything in and then show someone your phone and then they take your phone and type back an answer and you show them? Or you can use a book what <laughs> not the dirty hungarian phrase book drop well, your um, panty sir william it is almost lunchtime i mean yes you, you can use that book i don't know how effective it would be <laughs> but my um, nipples explode with delight <laughs> the um i mean people are complaining because it's on google servers but tell me something that isn't Right. You know, every time Google Home... My little box over here, my wire tap that sits in the bedroom and my daughter's bedroom and the lounge room and the office. Yep. That all goes through Google at some point. You know, let's just just deal with it. (laughs) If you don't like it... My phone is constantly dialing back to Google all the time. That's how it gets stuff done. Yeah, because you dial stuff these days. (laughs) Ah, connecting through the web, through the intertubes. Because, yeah, I mean, that's the, unless you, you know, you can easily enough run VPN. Like if you run um, the Opera browser, it has a built-in VPN these days. Um, really? It's actually pretty decent. Uh, it's fairly quick and reliable and has multiple places, multiple places you can set it to. But it's only within the browser. Yep. Uh, if you want to do other stuff, you can use VPN. 
just so easy to set up these days. It's all it's all a couple of clicks and they're set up and you I'm turn on them on right off, now. You know, you turn them on and off whenever you want. Um, it I'm, hasn't slowed slowed down this show, right? I'm streaming 1080p and it's yeah. going through VPN in Sydney. That's it. I don't um I don't use a VPN for normal stuff just because you got to be careful. Stuff like Facebook and Google and especially banks tend to freak out if you log in through a VPN. Um, I do all my banking on the phone, so it probably doesn't even notice. Yeah, probably. But I have been to stuff and I'm like, why the hell is this not working? Then I turn off the VPN and it's like, oh. Yeah, like Minecraft. Yes. (laughs) Um, My my NAS has a built-in VPN, so everything, whether it's the torrents, whether it's the remote accessing and all that sort of stuff all goes through the VPN. My comp- my media center, I have a VPN on pretty much all the time. Um, but for my normal PC, I just turn it on on the odd occasion if I'm, you know, going... And who do you recommend for a VPN service? I use Nord. Yep. I've had good 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 luck with Nord. I've found them to be quick, um, really easy to set up. You can have it on multiple devices. So you can have it on your phone. You can have it on... You know, I've got it on all the computers. I think it's... I don't know how many licenses I'm supposed to have, but they haven't complained about me logging in on multiple devices. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's cheap. It was I don't know whatever it was. I think I got a five-year license for like forty-nine bucks or something. Yeah, mine was something like that with um, CyberGhost. Yeah, so, I just I originally used Nord because when I was originally setting up my router, I was going to use a um, OpenVPN setup on it through yep. one of the Linux options for the router and they recommended Nord because it integrated better and that's, that's how it all started and it sort of never eventuated but I figured, oh, well, I've got it, I might as well use it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> why not? So, um, so Zoom, which is currently this program that we're using, um, Zoom is actually, if you know of Skype or, or anything like that, it, it's literally that but it it's, uh, seems to actually work. <laughs> As, as compared to Skype, which <laughs> compared to most other programs, really, because we, I mean, obviously we've doing tried show, 10, 20. Yeah, we've been through a heap of different programs to try and find, you know, like Webby we used last night, and then it decided it doesn't want to play with widescreen anymore. Um, you know, we've tried a few of them have died, a few of the ones that we did like have died off. Hangouts are still flaky with, after all these years, they still can't get Hangouts right. Skype is horrendous, and Skype gets worse with the more people you have. We've set it on Zoom. It's just it just works. It's free for two people, or it times that after what forty five minutes or something with multiple yep. people. But um, Zoom has now fixed a security flaw um, that could save or y- used to be able to let hackers join your conference calls. Um, Hello, <laughs> I am hacker. Yeah, pretty much. A security vulnerability in one of the world's most commonly used enterprise video conferencing tools could have allowed hackers to eavesdrop on private business meetings. Zoom is used by over 60% of Fortune 500 companies and over 96% of the top 200 universities of the US. So which one do we fit into? Anyway, right. These organizations use the conferencing tools and means of easily conducting remote meetings complete with live audio and video feeds as well as screen sharing and file transfers. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. It does really good screen sharing. Uh, however, researchers and cybersecurity company Checkpoint found it was possible to exploit in the way Zoom generated URLs yeah, well, that's not hard. Uh, for conference rooms and use this to eavesdrop on meetings. By using automated tools to generate random meeting room IDs, researchers found they could generate links to uh, genuine Zoom meetings without password protection 4% of the time during tests. Uh, while random generation of URLs means this trick couldn't be used for targeted attacks against a particular organization, if attackers found a room of interest, they could, they could keep returning unless the password was added later. Um, so it'd be possible for members of the virtual room to notice that the attacker had joined a call. Often these meetings are very busy, so more members might not. So adding more members might, might not raise the alarm bells. Um, yeah. So basically, uh, the, what they've done is they've just changed um, the way it generates the uh, the numbers. Now I noticed that actually today when I pasted the link in for this show. I noticed the, the link had changed compared to what it used to. Uh, oh, right. They've also made it more obvious now that somebody's trying to join. So before, if you'd previously been invited, I'll switch over to, to Jason's screen here because it'll show up on here. Previously you'd been invited, it's got 
um, a participants option. You can say who's, you can block them or mute them or you can do whatever you want to do. Um, but there's an invite link where you can generate the link and, and show people, you know, get the link for that and show, you can either email it to them or send to them a message or whatever. But what happens is it pops up here when somebody tries to join. It says manage participants and it pops up here and you have to click on it and you have to accept them now to, to allow them to join. And it does that every time now. Uh, so if you left and rejoined, it would pop up asking to allow you to join again. Whereas previously, if I'd clicked on you and allowed you to join and then you disconnected and tried to rejoin, it would just let you rejoin. Oh. So if, and as I said, in a busy room where there's multiple people, you're not necessarily going to notice if one person joins and leaves and, and whatever. So, yeah, they, they've just changed the way it does that now. Um, That's great. So, it makes it just a little bit more secure. And it wasn't a huge deal, and it was such a random thing, and uh, it, almost nobody had ever actually done it. It was just possible to do in a in a controlled environment. So, they just patched it. It's not, not a big deal. They just changed the way the URLs. Before, they, they were random, but they were sort of sequentially random. Right. You know, within reason, you could... If you, if you used, like, if you hosted your own zoom meeting and copied the link and pasted it you could randomly change the last four numbers and you would probably find another room that's active so now they've just added letters and you know it's not impossible it's to hack but really like i can think of other ways to get somebody's attention security <laughs> through obfuscation yeah pretty much <laughs> facebook you like this one because you're a big advocate of privacy Facebook has been right. determined to give people privacy controls while they are on the social network, but recently it rolled out a long promised tool that hopes to give people control from the social network. In a blog post on Data Privacy Day, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced that the Off Facebook Activity tool would finally be launched globally, a tool that allows people to manage how Facebook tracks them across the internet. Zuckerberg had promised this feature since May 2018, which at the time he called a clear history button. While it had slow out rollouts around the world, started last August, it should be available now to the 2.4 billion people who use Facebook every month, Zuckerberg said. In the blog post, he explained the delay was because we had to rebuild some of our systems to make this possible. Other businesses send us information about your activity on their sites, and we use that information to show you ads that are relevant to you. Now you can see a summary of that information and clear it from your account if you want to. I logged in and tested mine, and there are whole heap of websites and apps and stuff that I either authorized or just happened to log me into their system because I'd been on Facebook in the past and you can go through, review them, have a look at the website. A couple of them were like, I don't even remember that website. And they said I had been there last Friday or something. So it's like clear and remove this from tracking me in the future by this website. I One thing I've noticed now when you use an app to uh, sign in or you sign in to an app via Facebook you know, to a website or whatever before it used to just say this app has permission to use your credentials you know it can't yep. post it can't do this it can't do that but now it specifically says this app you know uses I don't know the timeline and your friends yeah and... it's, it specifically says what it can and can't do and what you can and can't allow and then it says you know for this app to work correctly it needs access to say it's a messaging program so for this app to work correctly it needs access to your facebook contacts um and your online and offline status and then it says optional ones are all these other ones so yeah. by default they're going to be on of course but you, you can turn them off you do have <laughs> the option to turn all that stuff off um you know as i said like if you're on if you're on facebook you're not on it for privacy anyway so it kind of doesn't no. really matter <laughs> you'd use something like minds you know minds.com even their chat when you're chatting to somebody else it's encrypted 128 bit each way so it's the likelihood of it getting interrupted in the middle and it's not monitored by minds it, it's completely independent of them where facebook recently has been um busted deleting private messages which we know it's been doing for ages because i've had it do it to me you post uh -huh. something that it doesn't like and it goes no it, it shows up at my end it looks like it's actually gone through but never the person on the other end never receives it Oh, um, it actually happens quite a lot a lot more than they would care to admit but they, they got that happened on a 
to some. Uh, I was reading an article today about I can't remember who it was, but some high-profile person. He said he sent a, a link to a, a website to a friend of his, and then his friend never got the link. Ah. And uh, so he went off at Facebook for censoring his private messaging. He said this whole idea of a private message is that I privately message somebody, not <laughs> not for Facebook to get involved in the middle of it. Yep. So. Yeah, so that's why I like minus.com for that sort of stuff because it literally really is private. There's no there's no intermediary there. They don't want to know stuff and they're not selling your stuff. Yeah, that's it. Um, but yeah. So anyway, so uh, speaking, I'll, speaking of Microsoft, I'll go back to the Microsoft thing because apparently yeah. <laughs> I managed to do that and didn't even notice it. But anyway, Microsoft urged open source Windows 7 to undo past wrongs. So Windows 7 has reached end of life, meaning no more features and security updates. Um, yeah. So what should Microsoft do with the next Windows 7 source code? What should Microsoft do with... Do... Ah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Hoosa. <laughs> 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 so what should Microsoft do next with the Windows 7 source code? English is hard. Advocates at the Free Software Foundation are dema uh, demanding Windows undo past wrongs by releasing Windows 7 as free software. Um... The Free Software Foundation was started in ninety five. In sorry, in eighty five, it's long, um, long uh, agitated against agitated. That's not the right word. Against Microsoft's use of proprietary software licenses. Um, at Windows Seven launch, FSF urged customers to ditch the OS. However, groups like this campaign asked Microsoft to do the right thing and open source Windows Seven. So there's a whole thing along here, but. Give it away now. Give um, it away, basically, give it away, give it away. this started back when Windows 90... F actually, I think it was about when Windows 98 was launched. Yep. These guys, they basically take old PCs um, and they refurb them and they put... Uh, well, they they were... They're putting Linux on them at the moment. Um, but they were putting Windows 3.1 on these old systems that was going to overseas to students for schools and and things like that. Um, poor communities basically getting them for their community rooms and and you know, schools and libraries and, and all sorts of stuff. And Microsoft, even though Windows three point one was dead and buried and Windows ninety five was on the way out and they'd released ninety eight, Microsoft basically threatened to say, hey, if you don't take Windows 3.1 off these, we're going to fine you, you know, $100 million or something stupid like that. Uh, of course, they backed out of that because that would have been bad, bad publicity for them. But ever since then, they've been using uh, Linux on all their stuff. Yep. And they're like, well, that's fine. But in the real world, when these people grow up and leave school or, you know, whatever they're going to do, chances of them actually using Linux outside of the classroom is pretty slim. Yep. Um, so... Apparently, you're unstable. I was for a second. <laughs> <laughs> you need to take your meds as quickly. Um, so, yeah. So, basically, this is what that's going back to. They're like, well, you've got all these dead operating systems that you're, you, by your own admission, have killed off and you are no longer using. Yep. They've reached end of life for you, but they haven't reached end of life for millions of people around the world who could potentially use it and gain a better understanding of, you know, have a better chance... And also do bug life. fixes of their own. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, there's that. But... That, so, yeah, basically, that's what they're saying. Like, what, why? Why are you hanging on to these dead, you know, these dead and buried mediums? Like, get rid of them. They're not, it's not going to cost you any money now to give it away for free. Yep. You know, and their argument is, oh, but if we release it to you and you open source it and you get a virus, you're going to blame us. <laughs> They're like, no, that's not how open source works. <laughs> if you open source it and it's under the the GNU public license, which is the GPL, which is basically is what most freeware stuff's under, Linux is under, most um, things that are free for, for use are under that. It basically says that here's a thing. It's supposed to do this. If it doesn't do this or your computer explodes, it's not our fault. That, that's, yep. that's basically how that licensing works, you know. So, 
But Microsoft's been Microsoft, and I, I guarantee it won't happen. So they'll probably just continue to ship the computers with um, Linux as they have been, and then put Windows on them once they get to where they're going. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Which is basically what they've been doing. Put a Windows 10 theme on it. Yeah, they've just. Uh, they've just um, <laughs> one of the things is. Um, uh, oh, is it in here? I was reading it. Or was it somewhere else? I was reading it. They're like, um, it's pretty easy. We can just ship Linux. Uh, we just we just ship Linux out, and then we put an open source Windows Seven core <laughs> on it. <laughs> <laughs> that works. <laughs> but yeah, so if um, and that's the thing too. There is a lot of um, if you do have a lot of old tech floating around that might not be any good to you, but there is a there's still a lot of communities um, out there that want it, and there are donation centers you can give technology away to. It's better than just chucking it out. They uh, go through them. They might have a hundred PCs, and um, they might get ten working. But uh, you know that's going to make a difference for ten people who wouldn't have had a computer. Uh, I know even here in Brisbane, um, we had I used to, when I was unemployed for a while doing work for the Doll. I was actually working at one of volunteering at one of the centres there, and we were actually refurbing computers there, so giving them out to charities and whatnot. So. It is a thing that even is grab your old phones out of the drawer and give them to Telstra's donation box too. Um, yeah, just make sure you take the batteries out at this point before you do that because any slight vibration they could explode at any moment. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> we did mean Sam's. I mean, <laughs> no, just phones in general. Like they, they're getting on a bit now. Where's the old? Yep. Uh, can I find it here? I had. Uh, I think I can find it now. My Sonya's old um, Sony, I think it was a Sony Ericsson. Yep. Oh, it's from forever ago. It's got, it's got no, actually, it was, um, it's got a keyboard on the front of it and everything. I can't find. I thought I just had it literally. I had a Sony Ericsson K800i. That was a great thing. I gotta find this. <laughs> While he's doing that, I'll uh, see if I can do something quickly. United Nations scientists have warned that most countries are on track to totally botch the climate goals needed to curb catastrophic global warming, but there's at least one bright spot. Scotland is now on track to move its energy sector to 100% renewables by the end of this year. That's just in time to host the United Nations International Climate Talks in November. At least someone's doing something right. Environmental organisation Scottish Renewables put together a report tracking the country's renewable progress. To show Scotland renewables provided 76% of electric electricity consumption based on 2018 data in the report, and the percentage is expected to keep rising and reach 100% soon. That's because, unlike most countries, Scotland is actually moving away from fossil fuels rapidly. Scots have completely kicked coal, shutting down the nation's last coal fired plant in 2016, and it only has one working fossil fuel based energy source left a gas fired plant in Aberdeenshire. Um, it's not only um, Scotland. There's, I was reading an article. Finland. India is doing, doing it. a big two, aren't they? Yeah, Finland, uh, Sweden. Um, they're shutting down all their coal fire and nuclear plants, and they're running pure off uh, off renewable. In Australia, we're going to make some new ones and fire them up. Yes, fire it up, fire <laughs> it up. Which fire I mean, it you know, up. the only reason they're doing it is because they don't need it. They've got so much in the way like hydro is actually one of their biggest one of their biggest sources because they have so many natural rivers and waterfalls and whatever so hydro is is a big bulk of that um yeah they have wind wind production and solar but it's not it's not as as thing as as highland um yeah finn i was just because i was reading an article last week and it was listing all the all the things that they've they're we setting down. up snowy hydro too Apparently. Let's see if they get it right this time. <laughs> Mr. T likes it. <laughs> that worked so well last time. It's just something else for the Chinese to buy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think it's by 20, 2024 or something like that. They're supposed to be shutting down all their anything that isn't a renewable energy. Um, yeah, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Scotland. So... <laughs> There's a lot of countries that are doing this. I mean, you look at China. Okay, China has a lot of normal power plants as well, but they produce just in solar energy per day. They produce 
enough energy to power the rest of the world per day in wow. solar. Not that's only like I think it's thirty five percent of their actual power usage. So it shows you how much <laughs> power they use. But they can power the rest of the world for a day with the solar production that they make. Like it's 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 nuts, you know. So yeah. But yeah, there's the old phone, the old Nokia E E sixty three. Oh, nice. <laughs> still powers up and the battery still works. Last forever. <laughs> you drop yeah. that on the ground and the ground breaks, the ground, not yeah. the phone. The old two megapixel, two megapixel rear and what was the front? It's VGA. Point, two point megapixels all you need, son. And uh, it's even got the selfie. I don't know if you can see it. It's got the selfie ca- mirror on the back of there so that you oh, can, yeah. <laughs> when you're holding it to take a selfie, you can actually see. <laughs> so you take a selfie this way with high the... tech <laughs> <laughs> so i've actually got this powered directly off usb um this sits above my printer and i can remote log into this phone and watch the camera and so i can watch what my printer's doing <laughs> still got a use yep still works after all these years better than the 45 dollar uh android phone i bought to do that purpose actually failed so but yeah, no, it's um, you know, uh, is uh, and what's the other thing that they're doing? The f- is it Fukushima? They're releasing the they're about to drain the reactors straight into the ocean, ah. so they can depower them. So just in case there's not enough, they're not pumping enough radioactivity into the ocean now. They're about to drain even more. It sounds like a great idea. Yeah, um, couldn't harm anything. What could go wrong? Yeah, I know, right? Like, it's not like it's, you know, just old water or something. It's fine. <laughs> Have you actually seen the pictures on that, on one where it's leaking? No. Currently, like at the moment. That's the radiation um, that's still leaking from the reactors and they haven't drained them yet. Uh, right. Ah. So that's, that's coming from there. I mean, Australia's, you know, we're, we're here. So some yep. of the radiation is ma- is making its way down here already. It'll meet um, up with the smoke from Canberra. <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't want it to Canberra. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to get me that easily. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, so NBN. Soon as that old nutshell. Yeah, talking about useless companies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Expensive, useless companies. Yeah, I know, right? Pretty much. Um, so NBN is possibly trying to purchase the extra... Wow, that's it. I'm done. I'm going. See ya. <laughs> NBN is possibly trying to purchase existing dark fiber for enterprise connections, of course, because you know the average consumer doesn't matter. No. But in the face of mounting, criti- mounting criticism towards the national broadband network for overbuilding existing enterprise networks, the government-owned broadband wholesaler uh, has released a consultation. Wow, is that? No, that's right. It's just it's spelt right. It's just my brain spelling it wrong. <laughs> uh, has released a consultation paper to discuss how it could. Pro- uh, procure dark fiber for customers served by existing networks. As been noted by a number of network operators, industry commentators, a certain circumstance, the goal of encouraging economically efficient use of economically... Ef- what? In certain efficient circum- use of and economically in, efficient investment yeah. in. <laughs> in, in. Yeah. In certain circumstances, the goal of encouraging economically efficient use of and economically efficient investment in... Techn- I'm it's sure there was a much sentence. easier way of writing that. <laughs> <laughs> in telecommunication infrastructure may be better served by NBN leveraging existing fiber networks infrastructure where current owner is willing to sell access to that fiber. Um, so, I mean, not that we have a lot of dark fiber in this country. Or they really. could have just built the NBN the right way the first time around. Shh, don't tell anybody. They could have, but that would have meant that they would have had to get somebody else who knew what they were doing. Yeah. <laughs> they couldn't use And now how can you get all those kickbacks and deals for your mates who now suddenly work for NBN? Yeah, well I mean, you know. I mean if you job. if you look at how originally the NBN that I'm pretty sure it was an Italian company um wanted to do it 
See? Um, when they first put the bids in for the scum back, how when did the NBN start 10 years ago? Whenever yep. they started doing that, um, they wanted to run the optic through the through the plumbing. Yeah. Um, Great idea. They've done it in other countries. Yeah. Run it through the sewers. Um, and basically they said, okay, we can do... Uh, I think the rollout for the entire country was three years or something. And, and much cheaper. It would have all been fibre to the premises. Uh, it would have been, you know, completed by now. Yeah, every house would have had it. Um, it would have been a lot cheaper to do. I was just talking to Stryker. He's in the Western Sydney area and he might get fibre to the curb by June this year if he's lucky. Might. Yeah, I know. He can it's... see the pit from his house. It's in the street right outside his house. <laughs> but they might be able to roll it to his house. To, but it's going to be fibre to the curb, which is still not that great. Yeah, well, I mean, fibre to the curb is better than, you know... The DSL he's currently on. But I was going to say, better than the, fi- the, the NBN I'm currently on, which is a glorified DSL. Is it? I have to admit, it's actually quite stable. The speeds aren't great, but it's 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 fairly stable. Even in when we get massive downpours and storms, it doesn't seem to get affected too much. So even though um, I'm on copper, it still yep. does a pretty decent job. So I guess that's something. Um, the launch of the iPad 10 years ago was a big surprise to everyone in the industry, including Microsoft executives. <laughs> Steven Sinofsky, the former president of the Windows division at Microsoft, shares Microsoft's perspective as well as those of other industry f- figures in the press on the iPad. The announcement 10 years ago today of the magical iPad was clearly a milestone in computing. It was billed to be the next computer. For Stephen, managing Windows just weeks after the launch of Microsoft's latest creation, Windows 7, it was much a challenge as magical. Given that Star Trek had tablets, it was inevitable that form factor would make it to computing. Yes, the diner book. Microsoft <laughs> had been working for more than 10 years starting with the WinPad through tablet PC. We were fixated on Win32, Pen and more. The success of the iPhone, 140,000 apps and 3 billion downloads announced that day, blinded us at Microsoft as to where Apple was heading. Endless rumors of Apple's tablet obviously meant a pen computer based on the Mac. Why not? Industry chased this for 20 years. That was our context. The press, however, was fixated on Apple lacking an answer. And it seemed to demand answers to netbooks. Those small, cheap Windows laptops sweeping the world. Over 40 million sold. What would Apple's response be? We worried. A cheap pen-based Mac. Jobs said that a new computer needed to be better at some things, better than an iPhone or iPod, and better than a laptop. Then he just went right at netbooks, answering what could be better at these things. Some people have thought that that's a netbook, the audience joined in a round of laughter. Then he said the problem is netbooks aren't better at anything. They're slow. They have low-quality displays, and they run clunky old PC software. They're just cheap laptops. Cheap laptops, from my perch, was a good thing. I mean, inexpensive was a better word. But we knew that netbooks and Atom were really just a way to make use of the struggling efforts to make low-power, fanless Intel chips for phones. A brutal takedown of 40 million units. Sitting in the Le Corbusier chair, he showed the extraordinary things this new device did, from browsing to email to photos and videos and more. The real kicker was that it achieved 10 hours of battery life, unachievable, unachievable in PCs struggling for four hours with their wearing fans. There was no stylus, no pen. How could one input or how could one input be productive? PC brains were so wedded to keyboard, mouse, and pen alternative that the idea of being productive without those seems fanciful. An instant standby, no viruses, rotatable, maintain quality over time. As if to emphasize the point, Schiller showed rewritten versions of Apple's iWorks for the iPad. The iPad would have a word processor, spreadsheet, and presentation graphics. Running out the demonstration, the iPad would also sync with iTunes content too. This was still early in the travails of iCloud, but really a game changer Windows completely lacked, except in the enterprise with crazy server infrastructure or consumer live apps. 
iPad had a 3G modem because it was built on the iPhone. If you could figure out the device drives and software for a PC, you'd need a multi-hundred dollar USB modem and a $60 a month fee at the best. The iPad made this a $29.99 option on AT&T and a slight uptick in purchase price. Starting at $4.99, iPod was a shot right across the consumer laptop. Consumer laptops were selling over 100 million units a year. Pundits were shocked at this price. Yeah, Interesting it's... to hear about it from Microsoft's point of view. <laughs> yeah, well, they know that they got their asses kicked on that area, that aspect, so... No, they're no. still trying to do something with Surface tablets, but they, they can't take iPad away from Apple, even with that. No talk of the Android stuff, though. Really? No. Um, but the funny thing is, the Android was doing it before Apple, but for some reason, they didn't mention that. It doesn't get onto the <laughs> radar. So that's the... Uh, Palm Computing. Jeff Hawkins, the founder of Palm Computing, created a grid pad. He started the mobile device thing. Pretty much. Apple's Newton message pad. <laughs> Eat up, Martha. Yes. Since the 97 was the year of the Palm Pilot. Yep. I remember uh, living in Melbourne around that time, everyone had a Palm Pilot. I had a handspring or visor prism color screen, son. Either the Palm Pilot or the Compaq, whatever the Compaq version of that was. Yep. A lot of people had that too. Pocket PC. That's it. It's, uh, I had one of those as well. Microsoft's first attempt at a tablet. <laughs> the Windows XP tablet. Yes, wonderful thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, the motion computing tablet. Mid 2000s. They're mostly used by factories and the military. It cost a yep. cool $2,167. <laughs> and you couldn't play Doom on it. iPad in 2010. As of last October, Apple sold at least 100 million. Nice. Uh, and this is... Must be old. This is 2013. This yep. thing, because it says Apple has sold at least 100 million units. It is expected to sell 33 million units in 2013. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so this is an old article, but I just found it interesting because it's got all the, you know, the interesting, like the Galaxy tab. tab. You know. I have one of those. I've still got, I've one. got two of them. Still use them all the time. Amazon Kindle, which I don't really see the point, to be honest. Yep. Uh, Sony's S2, that died as quickly as it was made. Microsoft Surface launched in 2012. Um, what's that? The Pad Phone 2 <laughs> by combining smartphone and tablet into one unit. Uh, and yeah, so that's uh, fun. Yeah. My audio, I just realised for those people listening, my audio is going to be quiet for that bit because I didn't talk into the microphone. Apparently, that's the thing you need <laughs> to do. Who would have thought? Uh, how long have we been going for? Um, I don't know. A bit over an hour. Over now. Yeah. Got time for a quick one? Always got time for a quickie. Atari is in talks to build a series of gaming hotels across the country. The hotels, which will be created in conjunction with innovation and strategy company GSD Group and real estate company True North Studio, promise to be a one of a kind video game themed destination. The hotels are planned for Phoenix, Las Vegas, Denver, Chicago, Austin, Seattle, San Francisco, and San Jose. The first is set to break ground in mid-2020. At first glance, a video game-themed hotel might sound too gimmicky to be anything other than an old company's pipe dream. But there's reason to believe that, if executed well, the Atari Hotel could actually work. As the company reports in its press release, more than $152 billion was spent on games last year alone, and games love to get together and gamers love to get together and compete. It even looks like the Atari symbol on it. Mm. Which they got from, did they get the idea from Symbol? Uh, it's Pong with the two paddles uh, bent okay. in the center to make an A, but the center line, yep. the, the Pong went the across the Pong line, ball. Yeah. First Tower Hotels plan to break ground this spring in Phoenix. Immediately, immediately, 
followed immediately by Austin, Chicago, Denver, Las Vegas, San Francisco, San Jose, and Seattle. They're not messing around. They're oh, gonna they're gonna do, there. they're gonna make one, and then twelve seconds later, there's gonna be eight of them. Right. <laughs> they multiply like space invaders. Uh, store <laughs> store coming soon. Oh. Click here to buy one now, Mister T. Yeah, I know, right? That's what I was hoping to. <laughs> Put in your pre-order. <laughs> Get one up in Brisbane going. Yeah, that's it. So, the website doesn't have a heck of a privacy policy. <laughs> Terms of use. This privacy policy has been developed to inform those users who are concerned with how their personal identifiable information is being used on AtariHotels.com. <laughs> <laughs> um, Unsubscribe from it using your Facebook pri- privacy. That's it. So, yeah, I actually like the look of it. it it looks pretty cool. Doesn't it? I just nice hope that, design. like, I get that it's supposed to be f- for gamers and stuff like that, but I hope they make it right. You know what I mean? Like, if you've got an older game, it needs to be on an older screen. Yep. You can't have an Atari on an LCD. It just doesn't work. No. I know a lot of people are excited about the Intellivision Amico device that's come out. Uh, I don't know about the Ataris, though. That weird-looking Atari. Yeah, I saw that the other day. I mean, that's the same problem. I've got a classic Nintendo Mini thing that they released. And it just doesn't look right. Like, I've played it on my TV. I've played it on a monitor. I've played it on a few different things. And it just doesn't feel right. Same. It feels yeah. wrong, you know. Yeah. They have a CRT mode that emulates... You know, With noise, the lines, but scan lines. It just makes it look worse. <laughs> yep. um, there's just something about it. And two, obviously, you've got to play it in a square form factor on a rectangle screen. So you've got black bars on both sides. And okay, it does, you can stretch it. That makes it worse. You can play it square, yep. but then you kind of, I don't know. I, I, I would like some, I mean, there are still manufacturers that make CRTs specifically for that application because there are some applications where. Um, they still have to use CRTs. Like I know in a lot of the medical fields, they can't use LCDs and plasma stuff. Is they have to use CRT monitors because of the way the interference works or something, noise suppression or I don't know what it is. But yep. So I know they're still being made, but I don't know. Well, Intellivision made their new Amico device that's got a controller on it that you twist around to play games and stuff, and it's kind of like a Wiimote or something. Oh, okay. But the, their Founders Edition, they only made 2,600 of them, and it's got like a wood grain look on it sold out in like 10 minutes 2600 just went bang sold not overly Everyone surprising they're really. very excited by it new games old games done in new styles all this sort of stuff they'll be opening up to developers at some stage but it looks like have you seen the device we've got a picture of it there no i'm gonna find i can only find the old the old one the original in television amico amico hmm I can find a heap on the old stuff. The television. Can't find anything on the new one. Oh, there we go. Uh, oh, great. That's a pay-to-play article. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> they got IntellivisionEmico.com. Uh, I've just completely been done the wrong thing then. <laughs> here we go. All right. This is the thing here. Click on that, click on that, switch over to this thing here. There you go. There we go. The Intellivision Emico is real and its goals are commendable. Yep, they sold out of the Founders Edition. They might have a picture of it's got wood green on it. But you can get the white version there and a few other colours. Okay, so yeah, it's the, they've kept, because if, if you know the original, um, the original Intellivision um, device, it's you know, if anyone's ever seen it, you can sort of see it there. It's got the the scroll wheel on the... Of course, Wikipedia has page. crappy pictures, but yeah. You can yep. see it's got the the key, the key pad there, which they've replaced with the screen, and then it's still got the scroll wheel on the bottom there. Yeah. So you can see that they've kind of kept to the same sort of feel anyway. There's yeah, they the, want to bring it back to two people playing together rather than just one person sitting in there computer room and all their friends are all over the internet but they never see each other yeah why your friends over on split screens 10 bucks for a game that's not bad yeah 
Um, apparently Google's attempting to do something similar, but I think game stream from anywhere on the, the Intellivision is attempting to do it by creating a more friendly environment. The fact that a console is a couch cult focused and one's phone can become a controller through a free app. Oh, okay. So you can have multiple players, even if they've got two controls, you can have more people playing through their phone. Yeah. That's can anybody nice. say lag? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. It's something yeah. to look out for. Sold out immediately. Oh, I'm not surprised, to be honest. No, I'm not surprised at all. Did they say how much? I think uh, it was up the top somewhere. Yeah, I can't see it on here. Um, that was the page I just had. Yeah, it's not on here. The I can founders see. edition, uh, two ninety nine was the founders mm. edition. That's not bad. Which had, uh, signed vintage wood grain Amico and many other founders are in the exclusives. Plus, the best part you'll get your Amico before it's out in stores later in the year. So you got. Vintage wood grain Amico with five games numbered and signed by Tommy Tallarico. $50 RFID golden ticket. I got a golden ticket. Heard of that before? An exclusive founder's patch commemorating the launch. Exclusive founder's pin. Exclusive lenticular poster signed by the entire team. And rock out with Earthworm Jim, <laughs> who's being exclusively made for this new platform. So if you liked Earthworm Jim before and you want to play it again, this is the only place you can do it. I like Earthworm Jim. It's pretty cool. Well, you have to say it right. <laughs> I can't. Earthworm it hurts. Jim. Parts of me hurt if I try to do that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening to the Aussie Tech Hedge Show broadcast weekly. We can be found at facebook.com slash Aussie Tech Heads, twitter.com slash Aussie Tech Heads, and troop.com slash Aussie Tech Heads. Email us, Glenn, Will, and Warlock at aussietechheads.com.au. You can hear Aussie Tech Heads on Aussie Tech Radio. 24-7 back-to-back play of some of the best tech-related shows from around Australia and New Zealand. New shows are added each Friday. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye.